So hi everyone, my name is Bernard. Um, I am founder and CEO of AlphaCam. Um, today is our third uh, session for the Global Mind Series. It's a project that we do with the Taiwan Startup Stadium, um, which is kind of a government organization that promote startups in Taiwan, um, bring them out. Um, I'll do a bit of intro for us. Um, so we have four locations this time. Actually, it's quite, quite, quite intense. Um, so in Taiwan, uh, it's us. Um, the below, we have actually four locations in within Taiwan itself. Um, and thanks to some of our sponsors, uh, Faker Founder, Ting Tong, Ji Fei Bu, and San Top. Um, next slide. And then in Singapore. Um, thanks to our friends at Capital Land who gave us a location for the broadcast. And then Hong Kong, of course, Blue, our friends at Blueprint and Vpon. Uh, Blueprint is, for those who don't know, is one of the biggest kind of co-workspace as well as uh, 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 Accelerator um, in Hong Kong, uh, of which I'm a part of mentor. And Vpon is a friend of ours. Um, they are one of the top mobile advertising platform in Asia. And finally, Korea. Um, this is the first session with Korea. Thanks a lot for for hosting us, um, the Accelerate program, uh, and also Rehoboth. I hope I got that right. Um, so just want to hear it from the Korean folks. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. OK, great. Thank you. So um, after kind of words for our sponsors, uh, just a quick intro for AlphaCam. We are startup school. Uh, we, I started it um, about two years ago, and and we started in Hong Kong, Taiwan, and now we're in Singapore. Uh, we give our students basically three things: a set of core skills, a mindset, and a network. A network, uh, a lifelong network, alum, instructors, and mentors for them to kind of embark their career in technology. Um, we not for entrepreneurs specifically. Um, we also help people to. Um, get into quality startups. So it's kind of like the MBA version um, for startup. Either you can start your own or we help you to get into the top startups um, in Hong Kong, Taiwan, Asia, even in the US. Um, and our in Taiwan, just a kind of words of uh, what we do in Taiwan, we are running our 10th camp, which starts in <coughs> In Singapore, we just successfully registered as a private school. Um, that's very exciting. So our first camp will start in August 15th. We teach um, you one of these four things, how to build a great mobile app, uh, a full set web development uh, using Ruby and Rails, using experience design, and all marketing and growth. So those are the, one of the four um, tracks that uh, you get to come to learn in addition to how startup works, fundraising, and all that stuff. Uh, so finally, without further ado, uh, I want to introduce our guest speaker today. Uh, it's it's a guy that I've known for a couple of years, but I've never seen him again uh, in the last 10. Um, so Mark and I went to um, MIT Sloan Business School together, uh, and, and a great guy. And after Sloan, I went to be a consultant, and he went to do something a lot more exciting, which is joined uh, HubSpot as a Chief Revenue Officer. Uh, fast forward 10 years now, obviously HubSpot is, has IPO'd, and Mark has taken a role at the Harvard Business School as a senior lecturer uh, to talk about sales. Uh, Mark has spoken in a lot of places, including like Google Ventures and things like that. Um, so without further ado, I'll pass the mic to Mark. Excellent. Thank you, Bernard. Um, let me make sure I've got share screen on. <clears throat> okay. You guys see it okay, my deck? Excellent. We're good? Awesome. So, hey, great to be here, folks. I know it took a lot of logistics given all the time zone uh, uh, differences here. I have to apologize that uh, there's an above 50% chance that an eight-year-old boy will uh, arrive in this uh, door behind me uh, in his pajamas, um, not behaving himself and going to sleep like I asked him to. It's a little after 9 p.m. at night here. And uh, I try to get the household under, uh, you know, in set for this, uh, for this webinar, but uh, I apologize for my lack of professionalism if that occurs. Um, but I am very excited uh, to be here. 
as Bernard knows from you know our journey together at MIT, I'm a passionate entrepreneur, and um, I I do as much speaking as I can and advising as I can to entrepreneurs. I just it's my drug basically. And uh, kudos to you all for for starting off in your ventures, and I wish you all the best. Hopefully, I can have a little bit of an impact on that. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit. We're going to spend about thirty to thirty five minutes going through some of uh, these concepts of building up the sales team. And then uh, I know we'll have some time for Q&A directly from Bernard and then Q&A from all of you. Uh, so I hope you can you know, jot down or note your questions along the way and we'll have time to address those. Uh, just curious, um, how many of you have actually, and I can see some of you there, has, have any of you got to the point where you've actually hired a salesperson in your ventures? I know a lot of them are pretty early. Has anyone gotten to a point where you're hired Okay, so I see a bunch of hands there. That's great. Um, I may need your help through this process to kind of see where you guys are at. But my story um, was um, I, I joined HubSpot as the fourth employee and first salesperson, and, um, and we had a really great nine-year run. Uh, I ran global sales uh, for the business for the first seven years, uh, scaling my team to 450 people and getting the organization to over $100 million in revenue. And, uh, and then we decided to fork the business in two directions, uh, and I ran one of the product lines for them uh, as we led up to an IPO. Um, so I'm going to talk about that adventure. Now, the unique thing that people get a kick off of the story around is I'm not a salesperson by training. Um, like many of you, I'm, I'm more of a, a, a technical person. I, I have an engineering degree undergrad. Um, I started my career writing code. Uh, and then, of course, did the time at MIT with Bernard. So I've got this professional foundation of quant and data and process that I've always sort of viewed the world through. And I got very lucky that back in 2006, 2007, when we were starting up HubSpot and I was asked to take the reins on the sales side, that that lens was quite advantageous to um, building a sales team. And there were a lot of things that were happening in the macro world around technology and going to inside sales and how the consumerization of software that made this sort of data-oriented lens, uh, you know, enable a lot of innovations in traditional best practices of sales. And that's what we'll talk about today. So what I basically did was when I took the reins, I wrote down a mission statement for myself in the go-to-market organization, and that is predictable, scalable revenue growth. Now, there's nothing but a bunch of fluff in these words, but I will tell you, if you're ever raising money from venture capitalists, start off your sales slides with these four words. For some reason, they all get really excited about predictable, scalable revenue growth. That's what we want too. We've been looking for this. It sounds fantastic. So, you know, I don't know why it is. I don't know if the, the VCs out there get just excited, but they do here. Now, the meat and potatoes is really the four tactics that I used to drive that mission. And those were number one, I wanted to hire the same successful salesperson every single time. Number two, I wanted to train them in a way that was aligned with the modern buyer. Number three, I wanted to provide them with the same quality and quantity of leads every single month. And number four, I wanted to hold them accountable to work in those leads with the same successful sales process. And if I could do those four things, that's a pretty nice machine that would likely achieve predictable, scalable revenue growth. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So we'll start with the hiring front. And a lot of you said you've already started hiring some salespeople. And I usually ask people, you know, what do you, what do you look for in a salesperson? And people in the audience are like, aggressiveness and persuasion and work ethic and all these different skills. And I'll ask them how you assess on those things. And we'll have a little conversation about it. <clears throat> now, my experience is, all those answers might be right. It really depends on the context. And I'll tell you a story about why. I think it was my first year, about my eighth sales hire, I had um, convinced the number one salesperson back here in Boston, back here in Boston, Massachusetts, and I convinced the number one salesperson from a public company to join our company. We were literally 15 people. No one had a clue who we were. And I was just networking, networking all over Boston. And this number one salesperson out of 800 reps on the team decided to join our little startup. And when they joined, I, I rolled out the red carpet. I, I was like, welcome aboard. Teach us to sell. 
You know, I mean, if you, none of us have had the achievement that you've had. And I was amazed that after six months, they weren't killing it. They were not doing amazingly well. They weren't doing terrible, but they were not our top rep. And it just perplexed me. I'm like, how could this number one salesperson from 800 people not come in here with a bunch of clowns, basically, and really teach us how to do sales? And I thought about it. I'm like, you know, they came back. They came from such a different environment. And I thought, you know, they came from an environment where they were literally running Super Bowl ads on TV. You know, that's our big football game that you guys probably know. It's like the number one ad spots on TV. Millions and millions of people watch it. Everybody knew the brand for this company. It took one minute to explain where they were calling from and what the product did and probably about 10 minutes to decide if they were going to buy the product or not. That couldn't have been more different than HubSpot sales contacts at the time. We would call prospects and say, hey, this is Mark from HubSpot. People are like, what is HubSpot? Oh, we build inbound marketing software. But what is inbound marketing? Oh, it's the process of building content so people are attracted to your website so you can convert them to leads. Wow, that sounds amazing. How does that work? I mean, it was this long, complex, evangelistic sale. And you can imagine that the type of person that would succeed in sales in the public company environment would be way different than the company that would succeed in our small 15-person company. And that's when I realized that every single hiring formula is different. It's irrelevant for you guys to ask me what I look for in a sales hire unless you have the exact context that I have. But there is a process that you can engineer your formula and it is a very important process to engineer. It's not complicated either, but it amazes me that despite the simplicity, how few startups and sales VPs and founders hold themselves accountable to this type of discipline. And so what I did when I sort of had this conclusion was I thought about our context at the time. And I thought about the 10 criteria of a salesperson that I thought would correlate with success in our environment. And I was disciplined about, you know, documenting exactly what I meant by intelligence or work ethic or whatever. And I was disciplined about writing down what a score of a one to three and a four to seven and an eight to 10 would sound like. And I was disciplined about scoring every candidate and especially every hire against that criteria. And if only, even if you're only hiring three or four salespeople in the coming year, it's really valuable to go through that process, hire people, see if they do really well or if they do mediocre, and then go back to your observations and ask yourself, what did we miss? Why is this person succeeding and are we assessing them on that? Or why is this person failing and are we assessing them on that and iterate on that process? And what gets really cool is as you start to scale 10, 20, 30 salespeople, you have enough data to run a regression analysis. And that's what I did, right? Is we, we ran a correlation to see which of these observations that we're making during the interview process are predicting success in sales at our company. And this was the first regression analysis that we ran. This was not the end answer. I will tell you what our end answer was after years and years of iteration, but this was the first result. Now, what was cool about this, this what, you show, what you see here is uh, you know, a dozen or so criteria, and those that have the long blue line to the right were most positively correlated to success in sales, and the ones at the bottom were negatively correlated. And what was interesting about this was at this time, people were just starting to talk about how buyers were in power today. And buyers want a different type of salesperson. And this was the first statistical analysis that I did that showed it. The like, skills that we typically associate with an old school salesperson, like closing ability or convincing or objection handling, those were negatively correlated in our environment. And skills that we associate with, say, a good advisor, like preparation, and adapt, you know, domain experience and intelligence, those were really positively correlated. And so this really set a tone for me around the type of culture and the type of salespeople that I want to attract. All right. So 
there were five attributes in the end that correlated most strongly in our environment. And as I go out and advise lots of companies, I do find that these five attributes, although they not, may not be the top five, they are quite influential in success in sort of a high-tech software startup environment, which probably many of you are building. Now, all three of these are in the top five. I'm curious to know, maybe I can get a poll here. Which one do you guys think is number one? How many do you think intelligence over time ended up being the most important skill that we assessed on that correlated with success and sales? How many people think it was coachability? How many people think it was curiosity? Okay, that one gets every audience. Every audience thinks it was curiosity, and I actually thought so too. But coachability over time correlated most strongly. In fact, I didn't even have coachability in my first assessment of the, the characteristics of theory, that, that I theorized would, would correlate. It took almost, I think, two years of me watching the sales team and watching certain people that checked off everything else very well fail and reflecting on why that was. And it was because they would arrive at the company and say, Mark, you th thank you for the training. Thank you for the coaching, but I've been selling for a long time. I know how to sell. I'll be in my corner doing my thing. And those are the folks that really struggled, right? So again, these were the five criteria in order of, of rank for us. You think they might be influential in your environment, but remember the difference is that you've got to work on the process to engineer your own, okay? All right, so let's talk about um, sales training. Um, Bernard, um, I assume that it's, I should just go through here and not stop for one or two questions to get engagement. That's what you want me to do? Okay, cool. All right, so training around the modern buyer. We're hiring people successfully. Now we get to train them. If I gave all of you a red pen and said, circle the salesperson, who would you circle? The money-hungry, good-looking sales you know, gentleman here or the helpful young lady? Would you circle the sleazy cigar smoker or the intelligent thought leader? Would you circle the devil or the doctor? You know, it's kind of funny, but a hundred years ago or something like that, we created this field of sales that we all understand is supposed to go out and represent our companies in the market, talk to our potential customers, and yet when I do a Google search for salesperson, I get all three images on the left-hand side. Money hungry, devil, self-centered, sleazeballs. And I don't get any of the messages on the, or the images on the right-hand side. Helpful, intelligent, prescriptive. And my question for you folks is, is this sustainable? We just talked about statistical evidence that um, sales the buyers don't want to deal with these salespeople anymore. So is this the era that it changes? Is this the era that because of the internet, we as buyers actually have more information than the sellers do, that we don't need salesperson people anymore? And are we going to put up with what Google perceives as a generic salesperson? And do we have to transform and rethink the legacy ways of selling? And I really think that we do. Right? So in my opinion, <coughs> the best sort of role model for me as a salesperson is ironically a doctor. When I go to the doctor and she says, do you smoke? And do you have heart disease? I tell the truth. I don't lie. And neither do you, because we know she has our best interest in mind. We see the diploma on the wall and we trust her and we trust that she's just diagnosing our situation. And when she tells us and prescribes a solution, she says, this is what you have and take these pills. I'm not like, let me think about it. Or can I get 20% off? Right? Like I take the pills. Right? And isn't that a good, isn't that what selling should be? A hundred years ago when we created it, shouldn't it be that when I have a problem, I reach out to a salesperson because they're going to help me and they help people with these problems all the time, right? So there's kind of two philosophies that I think we need, to, we need to think about in transforming our culture of selling. And the first one is 
basing the entire sales strategy on the buyer rather than the seller. And the second is personalizing each step to the buyer's context. Okay. So what I mean by that is when I go on the first one, when I go and talk to, to startups, they'll say, Mark, we read your book. We loved it. We built a sales process so we can measure everything. I was like, oh, that's a great, great first step. Tell me about your sales process. They said, it's simple. It's four steps. We prospect, then we qualify them, then we demo them, and then we close them. That's not that different than my first sales process. It sounds pretty logical. However, I have never met a buyer who wants to be prospected to, qualified, demoed, and closed. Right? So what we need to do is rethink the sales process by starting with the buyer's journey. All right. So whenever you're starting your go-to-market process, don't think about what you, what you want your salespeople to do, but think about generically what the buyer does. And there's a three-pronged framework I like to think about. Awareness, consideration, decision. All right. So as a buyer, I become aware of goals that I want to achieve or challenges I want to overcome. And I start framing those challenges and I start educating myself around those challenges and I decide to prioritize that challenge. Okay? Then I move to the consideration stage. I'm like, how do I solve this? And usually there's a couple categories of solutions. I could buy some software. I could hire someone. I can hire a consultant agency. I don't know. There's categories. And we have to appreciate what is our the unique differentiation of our category, the category we're in. What's unique about it, right? And then as I'm moving down the decision cycle and I choose the category, there's probably a couple different service providers I can choose from, me being one of them. So how does the buyer make that decision? What buying criteria do they define? Who is involved at the company? The CTO, the CEO, and the CMO? And what are their different perspectives on it? And what is my unique differentiation as a vendor amongst those options? When I can answer all those questions and show that to a salesperson, I am now in a position to align my sales process with that buying journey. Right? And, I, and I, now I can personalize each step to the, the point that they're in. And that gets to the second part is now how can I personalize every step? When I get, you know, how many voicemails do I get every day where someone's like, Mark, we help companies like you score your leads more accurately. I'd love to show a demo of our product. How is that aligned with the stage I'm in? There's, like, first off, there's a decent chance that I'm not even in the lead scoring software market. But if I were, I'm probably at the awareness stage. So don't I want some education around it? Shouldn't the call to action on the voicemail or email be some like offer to talk to an expert on the subject, to hear about my context, to attend a webinar, to, de to send me an ebook that educates me on the value of lead scoring and how it might apply to my business? I'm not ready to see a product demo. And as I go through that process and I maybe start engaging with that company, I would hope that they know how I engage, what blogs I read, what web pages I looked at, what forms I filled out and what I specified. And the salesperson references that and tailors their process to, that, to my interests. Ask me questions about my needs. Just doesn't jump into the demo flow. And when they give the demo, every demo is different. That's what a true ex expert salesperson does is every demo is different. It's not the same slide sh deck. It's not the same features they show in the same order with the same words. It's all displayed a little differently with slightly different words that are more aligned with my particular need. Right? So that hopefully that gives you some sense of, of modern sell. And remember, it's that doctor that we're looking up to and trying to move away from the legacy brands that salespeople typically have. All right. So we've hired, we've, we've covered hiring. We've given you a sense of training, starting with the buying journey and building a sales process on top of it that is aligned with the context of that seller. Okay. Let's move to demand gen. Okay, think about this. I'll go out and ask audiences, how many people in the last six months have received a cold call from a telemarketer 
and you got into an engaging conversation with that telemarketer and you ended up buying the product. Usually like a couple hands should go up, right? How many people in the last six months have received a piece of direct mail at your house or in the office, or maybe an email from an, a stranger, unsolicited email, you opened it, you thought it was a cool email or a cool piece of direct mail, you end up buying the product, right? A couple hands go up. Versus how many people in the last six months have had a problem, gone online to Google or in social media to do research on it, and that research led you to buying a product? And that's where usually 90% of the hands go up. And it's a pretty obvious survey. It's like, okay, I get it. We are empowered as buyers today. We can do all the research and find all the vendors and all the answers in our bunny slippers on a Saturday night. We don't have to subscribe to what we call this sort of outbound interruptive demand generation, and the world has moved to more of an inbound model. However, I think the eye-opening thing is if you guys open up your business plans and you've started your go-to-market journey, and you ask yourself, how much did you invest in advertising, in cold calling, in going to trade shows versus how much did you invest in blogging and social media to attract people? And that's where there's still a misbalance. And we're just, as human behavior, we are slow to change. And I think part of it's just scary. It's new. Part of it is people just don't know what to do. But as entrepreneurs, this is that whole, like, the world is flat concept. It's an even more important concept and opportunity for you because these aircraft carrier enterprises that you're about to disrupt are very slow to move. And you're starting from scratch and this is a big opportunity for you. Now, I think where people are confused is they don't know where to start. How do I do? How do, how do I, how, how do I uh, execute on this? And I have founder CEOs come up to me after my speeches and say, Mark, that was great. I'm going to start blogging three times a week. And I'm like, no, you're not. And they're like, I thought that was the whole point of the speech. I was like, no, the whole point of the speech is you need to build a content production process. You're a busy founding CEO. What are you working, 70 hours a week? Now you're going to add blogging to that? Maybe you'll do it for a week or three weeks or a month, but it's going to stop the minute a fire happens in your company. And you need to think about building a content production process, and that starts with a journalist. Very few people realize that the journalists, people who are great at writing, hold the keys to demand generation. They hold the keys to the future of sales and marketing. And the good news for us, bad news for them, is their traditional industries are not on fire right now. They're struggling. Newspapers and magazines all over the world are struggling. And what you're left with is a group of extremely gifted individuals who are out there and don't know how to redefine themselves. And we as entrepreneurs can put one and two together and help with that transition. Right? So now when you're looking for this journalist, you don't need to find someone that's an expert in your industry. That's your job. You're a thought leader. You're a founder. Your sales team talks to customers all day. They know what questions come up and how to answer them. Those are beautiful blog articles. If you sell a technical product, your engineers are thought leaders in this industry. They know how to connect with engineers. They've been thinking about this problem more than anyone else in the world. Right? So what we need is a journalist that can just interview these people and translate those words into a, a beautiful article that a layman could, could appreciate. Right? So set up this thought leadership committee that you're on it, your sales team, maybe your engineers, your marketers, and have this journalist sit down with one of them every Friday morning, let's say, for an hour, and interview them. And from that one-hour interview, they can create a five-page ebook. An hour is a long time. They can write a three- to five-page ebook on this niche subject that they interviewed this one person on, on Friday morning. They can spend two days writing a few blog articles about subjects that are in the ebook and schedule a few dozen social media messages in LinkedIn or Twitter or Facebook or whatever. And each one of those social media messages is scheduled over the course of the month. They point back to the relevant blog article. And then at the end of the blog article is a call to action that says, did you like this blog article on XYZ? Maybe you'll like the five-page ebook 
that we wrote on the same subject. If so, click here. And a lot of people will click through and they'll find out. Good news. The ebook is free. I just need your name, phone number, and email address, and it's yours. And that simple process that took an hour of one member of your thought leadership committee per week and a, probably two days of effort from a journalist, an economically efficient resource, creates a, a nice subscriber list on your blog, nice subscriber list in social media. It increases your ranks in Google, lots of organic traffic coming from you, and a high conversion rate of that traffic to leads with that high value content. Right, so hopefully that triggers some ideas for you on how you can rethink the way you build demand and maybe hire one less cold caller or spend a thousand dollars less in paid marketing and invest in the frequency of your blogging and your social media uh, engagement. Okay, now the other thing uh, that I wanted to talk about was the importance of sales and marketing alignment, and as you grow these become really important organizations to make sure they're glued together, which has historically been very difficult. I have become intimately involved with hundreds of sales and marketing organizations over the years, and I will tell you that they rarely get along. Generically speaking, marketers think that salespeople are overpaid, spoiled brats, and salespeople think that marketers do arts and crafts all day. That's what we find. And what happens is these folks end up going to their respective corners and work on their trade show booths and do their cold calling. And that was how business was done for decades. And that is the kiss of death in today's environment where most buying journeys start in an area that marketing controls, but ends in an area where sales controls. And these groups need to be aligned. And so I had a great partner uh, in this journey, Mike Volpe, our CMO, who also was an MIT guy and a friend before HubSpot. So we got to work on this together and had the, you know, hopefully we're able to re remove a lot of the animosity that you typically saw between these leaders and these organizations. And so over time, we, um, we knew, that it wasn't long before we knew that if we gave a salesperson 100 leads a month, that they would connect with half of them and uh, create 30 opportunities and do 15 demos and close five customers for $800 of monthly recurring revenue per customer. And so like clockwork, we knew that that machinery worked. So it wasn't hard that if I, each rep needs a hundred leads and we have 10 reps and Mike should produce a thousand leads a month. That's a pretty good um, agreement that we can go away from this squishy, like these leads suck environment to try to quantify this relationship, a relationship I call a service level agreement or SLA. Okay, so in this case, it's like, okay, Mike, we got 10 reps, I need a thousand leads this month. Pretty good. Over time, we figured out that wasn't good enough. And for probably many of you, this is maybe a year or two away, but it's something to think about on setting up. It's really important in the, in the early stages. Is um, whenever uh, we had a lead produced, if that lead was a VP of marketing, that downloaded an ebook, that was a lead that we counted because that's a good lead. A VP of marketing downloaded an ebook. Great. Now, if a VP of marketing came to the website and requested a demo of our software, we counted that as a lead too. And of course, that's a beautiful lead. Now, which one do you think closed to a customer at a higher rate? The demo request or the ebook? It was the demo request by about three times. They were further along down the buying journey. But which do you think was easier for the marketer to get the visitor to the website to act on, to request a demo or to download an ebook? It was much easier for them to, get, to download an ebook. So there was misalignment in our system. I asked Mike for a thousand leads a month. And when his team got behind, all the calls to actions on the website changed to ebook downloads and none of the demo requests showed up anymore. So it was almost perfect. So what we did was we took that into account and we said, okay, and, and you, you have to kind of make this into your own, but we've got three buyer personas we sell to small businesses, mid market and enterprises. So if we just focus on the mid market here, when someone 
downloads an ebook, they're at the problem education stage. They're in that first awareness stage. On average for us, and I made these numbers up, but you get the point, 2% of those people, if we pass them to sales, will buy. And they'll buy around $200,000 worth of software. Right? So if I multiply those two, two numbers together, I get this lead value. Right? Now, if someone requests a demo, they're further along in the buying journey. They've done their research enough that they know they want to start looking at some products. They're at the solution research stage. So they convert at 6%, three times the amount. They also buy $200,000 worth of software. I, mu I multiply those two numbers together. I get a lead value that's three times as much. Now I'm in a position to put marketing on a revenue quota just like sales. Because I don't have to say to them, hey, Mike, I need 1,000 leads this month. But instead I can say, Mike, I need $300,000 of lead value. And whether he wants to get there through 1,000 ebook downloads or 300 demo requests or whatever the math is, that's up to him. I'm going to make my number either way. So this system was creating immediate gratification to the marketing team and reward for generating higher quality leads. Right? So in the early stages here, you don't have tens of thousands of leads to analyze, but you can at least just do a back of the envelope guess as to what this looks like to set a framework for marketing to hit as a bullseye. And this will create much better alignment uh, between marketing and sales and the accountability that they have. Now, sales doesn't get off the hook. If marketing has that level of accountability, sales needs similar accountability to work those leads in the most efficient way. And I did a bunch of studies on like, there's a lot of research out there on like calling leads quickly. If you call a lead in seconds and minutes, your chances of success with it as opposed to waiting hours or days is much higher. So we know, call them right away. But if I do get voicemail, um, when should I try the lead again? Tonight or tomorrow or next week? How many sh times should I try them before I give up? Five times, seven times? As an executive, should I give each salesperson one lead a month and have them call that lead a thousand times? Or a thousand leads a month and have them call each lead once. Like obviously, neither ends of those spectrums is right, but where is optimal? Right? So I studied some of that, and this is what it showed is, um, what you have here is a bunch of leads. Some of them were only called twice, and some of them were called 15 times. Now obviously, when you call a lead 15 times, the likelihood of getting them on the phone is higher. But that costs you more to go after that account. So the Y axis here shows the profitability that counts for the cost of that behavior. And obviously, we want to maximize that. So what you've got here is for the small business leads, the little guys, the optimal call frequency was five times. You should call your small business leads five times. That's what it told us at HubSpot. For the mid-market leads, the blue line, we should call those eight times. And for the black line, 12 times. Now I've seen a lot of research and, um, and these numbers are pretty close for the industry. It's always more calls than you think is optimal or more outreaches. It could be email, it could be any sort of thing. Um, so, so now that I had this information, I could say to the sales team, guys, we've calculated the ideal behavior to make the most money with the leads that we provide you. And coin-operated salespeople love to hear that. And we have programmed it into the CRM so you don't even have to think about it. All you do is push a button that says you left a voicemail, the lead will go away, it will come back on the optimal time to call the lead again. And we've also programmed it into the CRM so that if you're ever not calling a lead on that behavior, we will see a report on that every night. And they actually like that because that is their, that's their lead flow. They want to make sure nothing falls through the cracks and we are providing software to do that. Now, there are certain environments where you have to be careful and that could be perceived as big brother, but you know, there's ways to transition it. In the end, this is better for everybody. So we were in a position between the two SLAs to send out a nightly report that showed the health of our sales and marketing funnel and their accountability to each other. This is an example of the marketing report. We established that we needed $300,000 of lead value. 
And this orange line for the month of September shows our marketing team's ideal journey toward that 100% target. The blue line every day reports where they are on that journey. And this is so critical as we start to scale up because if they have a really bad three weeks and then make the entire SLA at the end, I don't have the sales. I've got salespeople twiddling their thumbs for three weeks. No leads to call. It's not going to work. But if they come out really strong and get 80% of their leads in the first week, I don't have the salespeople to call on that many leads right away. So this becomes quite a science to be able to hug this line as closely as possible as you start to scale. Okay, so hopefully in this demand gen section, I've given you some additional ways to think about building demand through content production and also thinking about ways to hold marketing and sales accountable to behaviors that are optimized for the outcome of the company. And they're kind of delivering these things to each other. Okay. So let's do the last section and we'll do a little Q&A. We've done the hiring, training, demand gen. Now we have to hold our salespeople accountable to working those leads in the same sales process. Okay. The key word here is coaching. Okay. I wish I could change the title of a sales manager to a coach because that's the most important thing that they do is coach. The biggest driver outside of hiring Getting hiring right is the most important driver of sales success. But outside of that, your biggest driver to increase productivity is good coaching from your frontline manager to your frontline salespeople. So what is good coaching? We've got to look at the game of golf as an analogy. And I've tried to learn a gol golf for a lot of years. And I've taken a lot of lessons. Okay, and one, one golf pro said to me, Mark, take a swing, and I did. And he said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to turn your grip over a little bit. I want you to lean back in your stance. I want you to put more weight in your right foot. I want you to think one o'clock, not two o'clock on your backswing. And I want you to give me more wrist on contact. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. I mean, I just couldn't follow it. I, now, another golf pro said, Mark, take a swing. And he probably inside laughed at my swing. But he said, here's what I want you to do. Just try this grip. See this grip here? Now take 100 swings with that grip. And I did. And 20 minutes later, he's like, how does that feel? I'm like, you know, I think that feels a lot better. He's like, now what I want you to do is lean back in your stance more. Take another 100 swings. And I did. He's like, how's that feel? It feels good. So it's a really simple example. But I, can't, I've, I have promoted 18 sales managers at HubSpot. And every single one of them in their first journey as a sales manager and a coach, get these salespeople out of training and they coach them in the same way that golf pro coached me. They see 50 things broken with that salesperson and they throw up on them for an hour and a half with that feedback. And you can just see the salesperson's head spinning and nothing gets done. And the best sales managers, the best coaches, they certainly see the 50 things. But they know the one or two that will make the biggest difference in that salesperson's performance. They do that diagnosis and they implement a coaching plan that is right for that particular diagnosis. And the best ones use metrics to do that diagnosis. I call that metrics-driven sales coaching. Okay. So let me show you what this looks like. Here is a very simple analysis of a sales team. You've got a bunch of salespeople in these colors here, each, each color represents a different salesperson. You know, Abigail, Brian, Catherine, Doug, whatever. Okay. And then as we go through here, this is a different stages in the sales process. A bunch of leads are sourced. A bunch of leads are worked. A bunch of demos are, are booked. A bunch of revenue is closed. And you see the conversion rate between each. So if I am the person in the purple here's coach, manager. How do I coach them? Sales it's actually naturally takes longer to correct them wrong. So how do you how do you balance that? How do you some might argue this it takes too long? I mean, I write content, it takes time. I float it around the internet, it takes time, and then you have to close it. Uh, what's your experience, your advice to startups uh, in yeah, terms sure. of the sales cycle? Yeah, so I agree with you. I don't 
want to confuse the sales cycle point. A, a lot of the data that I've seen, we certainly experienced this, and I think the majority of our customers experienced this, that when you generate a lead via inbound uh, marketing, a lead that actually comes to your website and downloads content, that lead closes at a higher rate and a faster rate than leads that were cold sourced. Okay, but I think what you're saying is definitely true. It takes longer. You're not going to like go on next week and write three blog articles and get a lot of leads. It takes time to build up your authority with Google, your um, your social media following, your blog subscriber following for that to sort of build up. But the nice thing is there's this annuity that builds up over time and it just snowballs and it doesn't really cost you anything outside of your resources. We ran a stat one day, I forget what the analysis, the exact stat, but it was something like, like um, 80% of the leads that we get um, from a blog article happen two months after the blog article is written. And so it's just like illustrative of how much of annuity start to build up. Now to your point, you have numbers to hit as a seed funded startup. And so one thing that we did was, it's, it's kind of never too early to start this. We started blogging probably about nine months before we launched our product. Nine months before. And that was huge because we, we started that cycle. And that was just you know us writing. We brought on a freelance writer. There's creative ways. I mean, you can leverage like journalists and a student journalist for credit. You can get creative on how to start this process. And the point there is, Start it earlier so that when you are going to scale, you've already got some some, mo some motion going, uh, which is which I think is a good call. The other thing is, and the, you also, if you do that, you build a better product because as you're testing out content and seeing what resonates, you're close with customers, they're commenting on the articles, you're seeing what they respond to, you start to get a sense where, like, where the pain points are. Okay, now the other thing is, I do like to combine paid with organic especially early on okay now I, I get it you know we get on our pedestals here and um we um you know we we talk about inbound marketing and how bad paid is etc i mean i think there's a place for my whole point is people over invest there and it makes me skirmish when 99 percent of the lead flow is coming from paid and there's an inadequate investment on the content side because at some point usually that runs out now, I love paid as a short-term fix, and I also love it to learn and experiment faster, right? So, like, we can run an experiment in Facebook ads or Google ads around a particular audience and a particular message and learn something in two days, right? That will tell – that gives me – I can't do that in content, right? So, so, if I can be experimenting there and take advantage of some of those veins and ceilings that I find and then – moving those learnings over to the content strategy, then I have probably 10 times the success rate with content because I've already proven that that content is of interest with this audience. And if I attract leads in that area, they actually close into business. So that, that's you know, a couple of thoughts in there is number one, start really early. Um, and number two, um, use paid to complement it, test and learn and implement that into your content strategy. Thank you. And my second question, and I, I'm going to address some of this that's that's kind of flowing in. Um, do you, as a sales lead, uh, the leader of the sales team, um, do you evaluate the content? Or the, the problem with the content is, is it's actually very hard to tell its effectiveness upfront, right? Or what, what's your experience in, or it's a marketer's job um, to, to validate it. Let's say I have like, I've hired five students, right? And they, the KPI is right, like two pieces of content every week. I think that's, so, that's easy. But when the content start coming in, um, what was your experience? Do you just like look at it as long as you think it's okay, you publish it? Or there's some kind of level of assessment that you could tell uh, if these content will be effective, how? Because that's that's yeah. yeah. No, it's, a good question. it's a good question. It's it's just like um, there's a learning iteration that happens, just in the same way that like when we write paid ads, like there's no way that you and I could sit down and go into Google AdWords or Facebook, write an ad campaign and get it perfect the first time. The way we get it perfect is through thousands and thousands of iterations and learning. We take extreme, we look at extremities of those tests, extremities of the audiences. 
we eventually hone in over time on the right answer. It's the same thing with content. I mean, we can come up with some theories about what might work and what, what wouldn't. We should do our persona development up front. I think the best thing to do is go out and interview 50 personas, interview people who you don't think are a fit so you can validate that they're actually not. Um, interview people who you think you are. You see the words that they use, that you see the content they're interested in, and then go start running tests. And, you know, you can, you can easily measure like, okay, we, we put this ebook in front of, you know, 10,000 eyeballs or 1,000 eyeballs. What was the conversion rate of people that downloaded it? And then of the people that downloaded it, what convert, converted into the funnel and what converted to a close? Right? So we could do a mini segment analysis to see if that was a profitable endeavor. And that tells us something about that piece of content. If it was good, we can probably come up with 50 other ideas that are just like that. If it was bad, we've learned something and we can move in a different direction. Right? So just like marketing has always been, you know, test, measure, and learn, it's the same thing with content. And you just have to measure it in the right way. Got it. Thank you. Uh, a question from Korea. Uh, what are the, some of the red flags you've encountered when looking for coachability? I think that's a, a softer attribute that you look for. Okay? <clears throat> what will be some of the signs that that's, that's a problem? Yeah. How do you look for an interview maybe? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let me just spend three minutes. I'll just tell you my end-to-end -end interview and in big, in big, embraced in that will be my, um, <clears throat> the coachability assessment, which is my impo most important part. So my interview starts in the hallway when I reach a sales, when I meet a sales candidate. Um, you know, I, I like to see how they've prepared. Like, do they recognize me? You know, my, I'm, I'm out there. They can, they can look up my LinkedIn. Do they ask me something about like something I've written lately or something that happened in my personal life. I like that. It shows that they took the time to do some research. It also shows that they can break ice and build rapport and use the information that's out there to carry a conversation. And then I also look at like, when they do ask me questions and I answer them, they just moved on to the next canned question or do they, do they ask a good follow on question? That really shows me some nice curiosity. Now, if they miss that opportunity, it's not like they're not hired, but it's just like, it shows me a lot. And I really like some big check marks if they actually pull that off. We get into the interview room and um, I'll warm them up with like, you know, why are you interested in the company and forget the company didn't exist. Um, you know, where do you want to go in your career in the next five years? Um, and, and just warm them up with some of that stuff to see who they are and like how, whether we can make good on those uh, desires. And then I'll do a little bit of prior success um, assessment. So oh, I noticed you're over at Oracle. Um, how many account executives are there? Oh, there's 179. What was your rank? Oh, wow. 15. That's top 10%. That's fantastic. Was that based on revenue or bookings? Um, you know, and, and so I get a little bit of an assessment on their prior success. Then we move into a role play. All right. So role plays are so critical, I think, in, in sales interviewing. And I like to role play on my company. Right? So let's take the, the HubSpot situation. I'll just say, okay, um, if, um, <clears throat> uh, it, uh, you know, let's say that I'm a VP of marketing at a security software company and you're a salesperson at HubSpot, um, you know, let's say I came to the website and downloaded an ebook on inbound marketing last night and you got the lead, um, let's role play it. I give them a minute or so to <clears throat> think about it <clears throat> and then we get into it. You know, Hi, this is Mark and they, they do their thing. I watch them in the beginning and if they, what they call in the industry, show up and throw up on me for the first five minutes and basically just tell me stuff that I could have just read on the website, I don't like where their instincts are right now as a, as a consultative seller and a curious seller. If they're really good at like, <clears throat> why'd you download the ebook and what were you hoping to accomplish? And they quantify my goals or dig into my challenges or implicate them and do all these types of things. Like I'm really loving that. This person has picked up some really great consultative skills and uh, they're very curious. <clears throat> then I might test them during that role play. You know, like, Hey, you know, I, I know this is all part of this is about SEO how does SEO work? <clears throat> I've always worried, wondered how this like magic Google thing worked and just see how much they've researched on this concept. That's pretty well out there on our blog, et cetera, and see how they can explain that. And then I stop the role play. This is where we assess on coachability. So I stop the role play and say, okay, how do you think you did? Have them self assess first. If they're like, I was awesome. And I'm not really that psyched about that. I mean, that's, you know, I want someone that's like self, you know, self analytical and, and, you can self-diagnose. And then I'll say, okay, in every interview, I give all candidates one area of positive feedback and one area of improvement. Because I, I don't want them to feel like I'm overly criticizing them and they're bombing because then I won't be able to assess them true, their true selves. So I'd give them a positive feedback and then I, 
I coach them on a need for improvement, using these around the depth of their needs identification. I might even get up on the whiteboard and draw some stuff, and then I, I observe them. Are they glassy-eyed as I'm coaching them, or are they taking notes and asking good follow-on questions? And then I'll ask them, like, so if you had it back, what question might you have asked to see if they're catching on and to see if they can, like, get it and ask a good question? And then I'll have them redo the role play. All right, now, don't expect a lot from the redo. Right? It's a very stressful situation, but it's the effort that counts. And if they actually improve just in that 15 minutes, that is amazing. I mean, you have literally taken a context that is your sales process and moved the needle in 15 minutes by coaching a salesperson. Imagine, imagine what it's going to be like when they go through training, when they spend a day, a week, a month with you. Right? So, so that's how I assess coaching. And the other little kind of learning in there that I like to apply is think about your interview process as the start of training. Like, I don't need to talk about what they did at their last company. Yeah, we can cover that. I can do behavioral interviews. But like, it, there's so many times where I'll talk to a company like, yeah, you know, this person didn't work out. I'm like, when did you know they weren't going to work out? Oh, their second day. I mean, don't you think we could have accomplished some of the stuff that were the signs that, you know, once they got in the classroom? So, you know, think about that for a second. How, what are the nuggets from, if we're going to go through four different cycles with a candidate, can't we just apply some of the first or second day of training to see how they're actually going to respond in our environment? And that's essentially what we've done on a real microcosm level with that role play and that coaching exercise. Um, Great. That, that's actually fantastic. Um, one question to go back on a content piece. Um, there's a question from, from Singapore on what's your suggestions on content? Do you recommend there's two <coughs> types, right? One is do the long form kind of evergreen type of content. Mm -hmm. There's another thought that's like short form, but high frequency. Mm -hmm. Um, what's your thought on that? Is there, is there one way work better than another? Is it need to be like a 50 mm -hmm. mix? Um, yeah. Kind of depends on your goal, um, and it's changed quite a bit. Uh, five years ago, I would have said hands down short, hands down short, frequency short. Um, don't over obsess on quality. That was the answer five years ago. It was just a less cumbersome world. Now a lot of people are in the game. I don't think the game's over. It's just about. I don't think the game. Honestly, the game will end when Google dies as a destination search engine, right? Like that's when the game will end. But until then, the best content will win, and especially the best content around your niche subject. So in today's world, you have to have a much closer eye on quality in order to stand out. And, um, and it has to be like aligned with your unique differentiation. So with the long, short, long form versus the short form, I think it kind of depends. You know, like for the most part, I think it's still short form. So uh, a good buddy of mine, Thomas Tons at Redpoint, has an amazing venture capital blog. Um, I've done some stuff with him, working on some stuff right now. He he is like he's done some tests, and the more of the 500 word length is right for him, right? Like he's, you can see by his blog, he's kind of high frequency, really high quality, really high quality. Um, and um, but but I don't think he like really go, goes long. Now you look at David Scott at Matrix Partners. Uh, board member at HubSpot. I think he only writes once a quarter, uh, once, a, once a month. But they're pages. And they are be they're beautiful works. And he's, he's built up a beautiful following as well. You know, so now, I think it, it kind of depends. Like, if you're trying to build up credibility amongst a group of PhDs, um, I think you probably got to go long form quality. Otherwise, they're not going to they're not going to go after the short form stuff. If you're trying to build uh, credibility amongst of a bunch of attention deficit salespeople, don't go long form. Like go short form. Make it quality, but go short form. So you know that that's my take on it. Like five years ago, the answer was obvious. Uh, today, definitely a higher bar in quality. Never sacrifice quality. And I think the short versus long form has to do a little bit about the persona you're going after. Got it. Thank you. Uh, we have tons of questions flowing in, so I'll try to speed them up. One, one question's on 
your process, but for very early stage small teams. So there's a startup in I think in Korea um, right now. Three co-founders actually trying to bring on board two salesperson. Would you recommend kind of using the same process you described, or there's like a smaller scale version of it? Like how, yeah. how do they tweak yeah. uh, for earlier stage teams? Yeah, great question. And I, you know, keep those early stage questions going. This this particular these concepts, some of them are very applicable to the early stage, some are. And this this question is a very good one. Um, yeah, the mistake that people make on this first hire or two is a couple of things. Number one, they shoot a little bit too high. You know, a lot of VCs push their um, founders to to hire like you know the big dog at the company they're trying to disrupt. And that breaks down for a lot of reasons. I mean, I wouldn't hire too high up in sort of the leadership ranks uh, just because you need someone that's out there making calls and it's just close to the funnel. Um, so I'd stay away from that. The second mistake they make is they may hire someone that was a top performer. But remember my example in the hiring funnel, they were a top performer in a big company. And, and what happens is even if they're from the same sales context as you, selling to the same buyer, maybe similar value prop. When they joined that company, they went through two months of training. They, 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 took, they, they had a, uh, you know, a, a, an ebook, you know, a, a slide presentation that was canned and given to them. These, this hire you have to make has to build the process, right? They can't just like walk in and there's a sales process. Lots of times the founders don't even know what to do. So um, what you need to think about here is uh, the, the, the final piece is, you may be at product market fit, but you may still have some iterations to do. So some of the biggest value you're going to get from these first two hires is the closest to the market that you get. And that, you know, you're probably not making 50 dials a day into your, cust your target customer market today as three founders and a couple product people. But when you introduce these two salespeople, you're going to be touching the market that many times. This is going to be overwhelming feedback perspective. And if you have a salesperson that's just out there giving the sales pitch and isn't very creative and doesn't listen to the feedback, you're going to miss opportunities to iterate quickly to where the market is, whether it's with product or messaging. So you need someone that almost has that entrepreneurial innovative bend to them. Right? So how do you find that person? Lots of times they're like, I've seen people bring on like sales engineers, you know, or startup sales engineers, I think do well because they're, they're technical. They know how to talk to sales people. They're, they're usually a little bit, I mean, sorry, they know how to talk to the engineers and they're usually a little bit more into getting the product right than they are like just getting lots of money from sales. Yeah, you need to make sales and they'll be hungry on that. But again, the feedback is just as important. Um, so, you know, and sometimes I've seen people who are like, weren't quite good enough to be product managers, but they, you know, they can go out and play this role too. So these are the folks and they tend to skew a little bit earlier in their career. So they're not adverse to doing all the grunt work and making the calls and that kind of stuff. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of a sense of who you should be looking for. Not the leader, not the number one dog from the big salesperson. Think someone a little more technical, someone who's going to be an extension of your engineering team that can talk to people that's willing out to, to go out there and try to close some business and give you some good feedback. Great. But the process remains very much similar, right? You can apply kind of the same thinking in the process. Yeah. All the other stuff of like, make sure you start measuring the criteria, um, the demand generation stuff, like I said, you should apply that months before you even launch your product. Um, build, build your process based on the buying journey first, then build the sales process to support it. The coaching that you're going to do, you measure these people. I was the first salesperson that I was by. I made the first thousand dials. I measured everything I did. Like you want to be able to do that to have the blueprint for future people. So as a founder, you want to encourage that. Got it. And, and on that same, um, same topic, we have a question coming in on what's the frequency of metrics review you have with your, with your sales team? Is it like a daily KPI review um, kind of round table or is it like a weekly, monthly? How, how do you do, um, how do you manage that? Obviously, you don't want to spend too much time on management, um, yes. but what's your frequency? I mean, that's the great thing about technology today is a lot of that can manage it for you. You know, what I would do is just have a, a daily uh, email dashboard go out to the whole sales team, the executive team, probably the marketing team too, just showing where the salespeople are. You know, the first, the first chart is how many calls did they make today? The second one is how many new demos did they set? The third one is how many customers did they book? 
and you can do it per day, per week, and per month and stack rank them. If you're the first salesperson or the founder and you're measuring yourself like this and people are hired in, it's just the way the business goes. And that's the best way to do the metrics is like, then when I'm, then I can do like a, I'll do like a weekly um, one-on-one with each rep as a manager and we can, we can look at the pipeline. How are you stack ranking? Let's fi- find out where you're falling behind. Let's find out why you might be falling behind. And then let's, that will drive some of the coaching conversations that we can have. Okay, so I, I get it. Like your conversion rates look good, but for some reason you're just not getting to the same amount of activity. You're about 30% lower than the average on total activity. So how can we get your activity up? Right? How can I help you with that? Right. So, so you can use technology to drive a lot of the measurement and check-in. Don't be afraid to send it out to the whole team and, and set that culture right from day one. Got it. So daily dashboard, weekly one-on-one to, to work yep. things out. Yep. Um, I'm combining two questions, one from Korea, from Taiwan, about your doctor's analogy. I think that's awesome. But doctors, when you get into the hospital, doctor shows up with the rope, which gives them kind of instant credibility. Mm-hmm. Right. As a salesperson, especially for early stage startups, kind of two questions front, right? How do you establish credibility when no one heard of you or your product or maybe not even read your content? I think content helps a little bit, but you still like who 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 are you? I think that's A. B is uh, especially again for start for startups, all products have the weaknesses. Right. So how do you when people go right after right after your weakness, oh why can't you do this? Mm-hmm. Stuff like that. How how do you navigate around that? So credibility, in particular, addressing your weaknesses. Sure. So on the credibility stuff, that's just one of those really really tough things about sales, and there's lots of different ways to do it. It's it's close to everyone always argues: are salespeople born or can they be taught? I'm a big believer that they can be taught, and this is one of the areas that's most difficult to teach, uh, because natural what you perceive as a naturally born sales leader is that person that you've met these people. They just build instant credibility with you. They do it because they talk about the sports team. They talk about common friends. They talk about the weather in a great way. Places you visited. That you went to MIT. That you know, saying that makes means you're smart. The best way to there's there's two ways that I I think is highly scalable and uh, kind of applicable across almost all businesses is number one, asking really smart questions about the business in the area that you work on. Right. So in our world, we help companies with lead gen. So I can ask really smart questions around lead generation and that builds my trust. Like, you know it when people are like, you know what? No one's ever asked me that before. When they say that, you crushed it. Because what you've done is you've gotten to think about a problem they care about in a different way. That's huge. Right. The other thing that works a lot with that trust development is, especially in, in B2B sales, almost all Business people, business owners, executives love to talk about their business. And there's a gray line between rapport building and discovery, right? Like we could just, oh, you know, saw the business online, read about the website, really interesting stuff, saw you guys were founded five years ago. What made you guys come up with this idea? That's amazing. How are you guys different than these folks? I've heard about it. Yeah, that, okay. And, and, and all of a sudden, like, it, it's just perceived as like, wow, this is a really cool guy that's interested in my business, but it moves on to, so how is it growing? And how are you, how, what is your growth model? You know, there's, there's a fine line between chit chat about a business, which everyone gets excited about, and discovery that helps you know whether or not you can help this person and how you can help this person, right? So hopefully that gives you some like, you know, again, there's the old sales stuff like the weather, the sports, the pets, the family, the friends, the schools, whatever, that stuff works. You're smart. I went to the school. I went, I've done this. I've done that. That helps. Asking great questions, really sustainable. Chit chat around business, the business everyone loves to do with the gray line movement toward discovery. Those are some ways to, to do some rapport building and trust. Now, the questions, what happens if they start hammering you on your weakness? What you always have to ask yourself is if you were in their shoes, try to be unbiased about this. You know all the other vendors out there you know your product and hopefully you've gotten to know their business. Would you buy your product and why? And then use that information to talk about the weaknesses. It's like, yes. I mean, when people come out on our weaknesses, it's just like, does that really matter in the, in the grand scope of things? Like in a nice way, 
how can you put that? Why would you weigh that above our unique differentiation, whatever that is, right? So, you know, that, that's really what you have to come out is you always have to be thinking about your unique differentiation and getting back to those questions I was asking. When you're asking those questions in a really smart way, you're educating someone about thinking about the problem in the right way. And by those questions, you can, re you can properly frame the way they think about that problem. And so a classic example for us is for HubSpot um, was um, we found a lot of people that were trying to solve their lead generation issue by purchasing cold lists of emails and blasting emails out to them. And, um, you know, we, we just asked them, you know, how does that help you get more leads? We would ask them questions around the strength of their email, email reputation. Because we've had so many people come to us after doing that and not working and having to move over to something more sustainable around content generation and inbound marketing. And so you start to pick up with like, they may perceive that that's the solution, but when you ask them questions that they don't have the answers to, that are smart questions that make them gulp, that's how you can reframe them away from something that's a perceived weakness for you and attempt to reframe their mindset around your unique differentiation. Okay, so it's, it's really hard for me to talk to like that and abstract Bernard and hopefully that, that, that HubSpot example gives you a little bit of clarity and people can try to apply that to their business. Got it. That's actually very helpful. But I, uh, uh, this sparks my, uh, one interesting question, which is the age old question. And I want to see what to take on it. Some people say a good salesperson could sell anything. Some people say, no matter what, how good you are, if your product sucks, then that's bad. What's, where do you lie? I do think that a good salesperson can sell anything, but I don't think they can um, make you a successful customer. Okay. So, so like, you know what I mean? Like, I think a good salesperson can use all the persuasion techniques out there and they can, if your product sucks and it's a totally wrong product for you, they can get you to buy. I don't think they can make you successful. And that, that worked 20 years ago when most software organizations were spending 12 month sales cycles selling huge enterprise packages that ended up sitting on shelves somewhere because someone sold them the dream. But today with social media and freemium and consumerization of software and free trials, you can't do it. You have to start with customer success. Got it. Very, very good. Um, we got two last questions coming up. A little bit, not, 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 not so much of what we talked about. One is on um, hardware. Um, uh, the couple of teams in Taiwan, they are in the hardware business, kind of consumer electronics and so forth. Um, and consumers in general, you have an experience advising startup that sells hardware. Is it different from software? Um, what's your what's your thoughts? And to see. Um not, not really on a lot of the concepts we've been talking about. You know, I mean, these concepts work whether you're a consulting company or an IT services company or a landscaping company and hardware, software. You know, none of, none of this was really that specific to being a software sale. I think the difference, you know, the difference between software and hardware is just like, um, you know, there's some significant distribution challenges uh, compared to software. Um, you know, sometimes you have to, you know, you have to deal with uh, inventory management, like the people that are doing these plays know it better than I, those are the big challenges, but like everything we talked about today in terms of demand generation, in terms of like understanding who you should be hiring in terms of like looking at the purchase from the perspective of the buyer first and build a sales process on top of it in terms of running a metrics driven sales organization, it's all, it doesn't even have to be a technical company. Got it. Got it. One very last question. That I think that's very interesting. Um, the paid versus content. Um, how do you, is it, how do you orchestrate the two? Is it very different? You just blast your paid content and test out keywords and then that drives your content strategy. Um, uh, how do you kind of use both in synergy? Yeah. Um, I think that's, it's done in a million different ways. Um, that's the way that I would do it first is, um, I like to think about the audience and I like to talk, think about the message and I can alter those variations and make extremes and use pay to quickly come in on, on those two variables. 
And then I can use that information to drive my content strategy. That's what I like to do. Now, there are organ, you know, there, obviously there's opportunities to create an ebook and get the ebook out there through paid. You can do that. Um, I would just be careful to like make sure you benchmark like what it what it's like to um, maybe push someone directly from uh, an advertisement. Uh, toward like your company value proposition as opposed to an ebook just to test it out you know what i mean like if you push someone directly from an advertisement into something closer to your product value prop that can then go to a salesperson um, you'll establish a certain cost per lead and cost per sale and then what you want to do is implement another step which would be don't drive them to your product value prop but drive them to the ebook which then might not be called by a salesperson, might be nurtured for a while, and then called by a salesperson and compare what that cost per sale might be, just so you can benchmark the two. But you know, I like to I like to test these variations quickly with pay and use those to drive my content strategy. And then of course there are opportunities to build ebook contents and even blog articles that you can promote through paid marketing. Great, but let's give a round of applause to, to Mark. I think that was a, a fantastic session. I think that was awesome. Um, so it's a wrap. Um, now, a couple of things. A is that um, I, we, this is our kind of first four uh, sessions of our Global Might series. We are in preparation to preparing um, another whole series. So please do stay tuned um, on the Alpha Cam website. Um, another message is we are hiring. Uh, we have about kind of 13 people in Taiwan. We are hiring aggressively in Singapore. We are also looking for uh, Hong Kong and Korea. So if you're interested in kind of education, helping startups, we'd love to he hear from you. We have our email here. And last but not least, um, we I'm actually going to, Mark, let's see how we could do this. I'm actually trying to buy 20 books um, off, off from you. But Thank it you. would be awesome. And I will ship them to... Taiwan, Korea, Singapore, and Hong Kong. But somehow, if I could get your like autographs on it, that would be like super awesome. So we'll we'll coordinate sure. how that works, um, and 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 we'll get the books out to to the to the audience here. Um, thank sure. you so much. Really appreciate it, everyone for the morning and the night time, and we'll be in touch shortly. Oh, last lastly, we'll have a survey sent to you um, later today. So please tell us. Um, how you feel about it. Feedback is extremely important for startups. So we are a startup too. Thanks so much for your support. Thanks everyone. Have a good day and have a good night, Mark. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you.